I will call to Sebastian to welcome him. Sebastian, welcome again. You can prepare your presentation. I am very excited to listen what you have for us today. And again, thank you very much for your participation. Well, thank you, uh, Anmar, and thanks for sharing uh, your musical skills and talent. I wish I could have heard you like just go like extremely high note. Um, <laughs> anyway, I was hoping that you were going to do it, but it's okay. Like you're, I'll let you. I'll let you off the hook for this one. Um, <laughs> so um, um, I'm just going to prepare here. So you should be seeing my full presentation now. Um, it is an honor for me to be uh, with you guys today, and I'm sorry I don't speak um, Portuguese. Unfortunately, I could uh, mingle my way around um, in Spanish and French and English, uh, a little bit of one dot language, but it's a, it's a bit more difficult for Portuguese right now. So uh, eventually, maybe, who knows, right? Uh, we always uh, are keen to learn uh, more languages as it is uh, very important uh, for our own development. Um, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Sebastien Denoyer Picard. I'm from the Huron One Dot Nation here in Quebec City. Um, I'm um, the vice president for the Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada. I'm also owner of two um, two Indigenous uh, tourism businesses as well, an online store and another one is uh, promotional items that I do. Um, I, I I love the work that we do as far as tourism because it brings all of us together. And more and more, you know, we 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 realize the deep impact of COVID and what it had on our, on our people and our communities. Uh, it's been it's been hard uh, to go through, um, but I feel like right now there's a resurgence of of you know uh, of people wanting to travel and travel differently, uh, travel in a sustainable way, travel in a more meaningful way, travel you know to to have a true experience and not only travel because you're traveling and taking a bus and stopping at one or two locations just to take a photo. So people are getting more immersed into what they're doing. So for me. It, it really makes me uh, proud. Um, and to be honest, like through this presentation that you'll see today, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big evolution. And, and from the mindset of consumer to, you know, like right now, like just the demand of Indigenous tourism or, or just like how it's highlighted everywhere now and on everyone's lips makes me extremely proud because we started so far and, and like, 15, 16, 17 years ago when I started in indigenous tourism, I had to, you know, pound my fist on tables just to make sure that our voice are, are, were, were going to be heard. And uh, it was crazy to me that we had to create documents and tools to define and, and show that indigenous tourism is a thing. And it's it's a big thing and, and everyone could benefit. So anyways, I don't want to, I, I don't want to step too much into like my presentation I'm just going to start off uh, just uh, so you guys have a better understanding of Indigenous tourism in Canada. I just want to start off with a quick video and then we'll get into the presentation. Welcome to our Renaissance. I'm sorry, you are not sharing your screen. Sorry? Can you share your screen again? Yeah. It's, okay. it's not sharing? No, I just saw you. Oh, okay, let's try that again. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Then revisit what it does to us and for us. A time we elevate each other, uniting to relaunch our travel industry. Here, our indigenous culture and history are woven into the fabric of this country. This is the home of the original, original. Welcome to Canada our home and native land. So this is uh, just a, a bit of a kickoff uh, to uh, introduce you to the many opportunities of what Indigenous tourism is here in Canada. 
Um, I mean, obviously, I'd like to start with the land acknowledgement. Um, um, you know, I'd like to recognize that I'm presenting today virtually from the Neo One CEO, which is our ancestral territory and it's un unceded territory of the Wendat Nation, um, and uh, as well as a, a traditional territory to many other nations who have gathered here and share their knowledge uh, and barter with us uh, throughout the years. It's very important that we do that. We recognize like other nations, and we recognize all the people that helps us grow. Uh, within the um, you know our, our our own space, and it's uh, very important that we continue to start with Atlantic acknowledgement because Indigenous tourism and recognitions and reconciliation starts with acknowledging where we are in space. Um, for those who don't know uh, what Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada is, we're an industry-focused, industry-led uh, organization, a national uh, non-for-profit organization. We are a membership-based organization as well, and we have 13 elected board members that sits uh, on, on our board, uh, coming from all 13 provinces and territories in Canada. Uh, those are Indigenous representatives from businesses, obviously, uh, which is very important for us in, in the continuation of the mandate that we have. Uh, our role is to support the growth of, of Indigenous tourism in Canada and address the demand of authentic Indigenous experiences. Um, you'll hear me say a lot about uh, authentic Indigenous tourism businesses and experiences. It's very important. Uh, we focus on creating a lot of different partnerships between associations, organizations and governments, uh, you know, industry leaders across Canada. Uh, we represent roughly about uh, 1,100 businesses out of 1,900 businesses that we have uh, in, here in the country. Um, ITAC, you know, was created uh, just it's a fourth iteration of a national tourism organization, uh, industry led, obviously industry focus. Uh, um, since we we've launched, we've seen uh, the huge impact that a national voice could have. And, you know, we've seen an increase about 493 percent in funding that goes to indigenous tourism. Uh, so it's not minimal and it, we continue and while we do work in other countries as well, one of the first steps that we always mention is to make sure that we can create those uh, national entities that control the voice and set the standards for our tourism industry to be developed. Uh, for us, we don't do that alone. We have a wide network of Indigenous tourism associations that work across the country. Each province and territory have their own associations. Uh, a few of them don't have them yet, but we're helping them shepherd this and build those. Uh, it is very important because like, they are the voice of the province and, you know, we all follow national criteria and national standard. And that's why Canada is, is up front and such a leader in Indigenous tourism in our days. Um, we've had a very, very successful uh, year since we started, you know, membership. We have 1800% uh, percent increase in total members in between 2019 to 2023. Uh, it's been really, really good to see, like there's more and more people wanting to join our association, which is, you know, amazing. Uh, we've seen as well, like uh, in market upgrade members, uh, we've seen a huge difference as well. So our role at ITAC is really to help and take every entrepreneur, anyone that has an indigenous tourism experience that is 51% owned and controlled, uh, it is to help them understand the different market readiness levels and making sure that we take them by the hand and show them how to get market ready and how to get to the export ready stages. So for us, it's uh, it's really the step by step kind of process that we are trying to do and wanting to evolve with our businesses and provincial partners. Uh, in 2022, obviously, post pandemic, uh, although we still see the negative impact of COVID and right now the natural disasters that keeps on striking. Uh, our country, but we've set the standards for 2022 to 2025 as a recovery plan uh, called Building Back Better. And what we wanted to do is to go back to pre-pandemic levels, 2019 levels, um, and, and make sure that we don't lose any players along the way. Um, so for us, our industry contributes to $1.9 billion in Canadian dollars, obviously, to the GDP contribution of our uh, country. Uh, which roughly is about 5% of the overall tourism industry here in Canada. Uh, there's 1,900 Indigenous tourism businesses, about 40,000, 39,000 uh, Indigenous tourism employees that work within our sector. Uh, and we generate roughly about $3.8 billion in revenues. So it is a big sector uh, when you consider all the investments that are made as well from different nations, 
And as well as, you know, because in Canada, we have three nations, a nation that is for uh, the First Nation people. We have the Métis people, as well as the Inuit people. Um, I'm from, you know, First Nation community. There's about 635 of them across the country. Um, and, you know, we're, we're roughly about 2 million uh, Indigenous people here in, in Canada. Um, some of the barriers to the growth of Indigenous tourism uh, in continuing uh, of fighting with the government and, and making sure that we have our space in history is really about, you know, the lack of existing uh, infrastructures. Uh, there's huge demand right now, more demand than businesses that can meet that demand. So it's, it's a bit of an issue. Uh, it's a good issue to have, to be honest. It's not something complicated, but it's it, it does it does mean that you know there's a, a big and huge need of investments into infrastructures that needs to happen. Labor market shortages and lack of uh, tourism training is one of the biggest issue that we are facing because when we're talking about uh, authentic indigenous experiences, obviously we are in need of having indigenous people to tell those stories. Um, limited air access to rural and remote communities. In Canada, we're still facing a lot of those uh, connections to our communities, connection to across the country that have you now either been reinstated by a higher price point, which is being very difficult for our people and for visitors to travel around, uh, but also uh, some of the lines and connections that have not been reinstored yet. Uh, so hopefully we can tackle this. We are working with you know main carriers in Canada to advance this work. Um, there's a lack of access to capital funding and a lack of marketing assets and that that what is stalling us a little bit for continuing to advance uh, as an indigenous uh, leaders um, we've set the standards though like one one of the very important thing is that we've given ourselves a 2030 vision and a 2030 vision not only for itac but for the whole indigenous tourism sector and we've been challenged by the government of canada to make canada the world leader in indigenous tourism by 2030 we recognize that this is going to be quite an heavy challenge. Uh, we recognize as well that, you know, the U.S. Um, with all the casino revenues are probably as far as GDP contributions, the higher ones. Uh, but we don't contribute. We don't consider those revenues within our tourism um, expenditures. So uh, it is not part of it. But we recognize right now with the, the, the limited amount of tourism businesses in New Zealand, Maori tourism, uh, that they are the world leader currently, um, you know, with most sales and most revenues generated from the 550 uh, tourism businesses that they have there. Um, so we are working very closely. We know we've put a challenge for us to grow as, as leaders, um, but also because we want to help and, and we know there's huge demand for our tourism sector. So what we're trying to get at is $6 billion in GDP. So basically tripling the size of our industry adding an extra 2,700 Indigenous tourism businesses, 60,000 jobs in the tourism industry, and generating just slightly over $12 billion in revenues. So that's our challenge. We've said that in 2019 when we presented some of the initial slides. Now the government is challenging us to get to that vision, and we believe that we can get there by all working together because right now the opportunity and the demand for Indigenous tourism is extremely high. Um, Interesting fact uh, about us is 33% uh, of our Indigenous tourism businesses are actually owned by women entrepreneurs, and it's more to double of the percentage of non-Indigenous tourism businesses. So we got to continue. We're matriarchal society. We got to continue to foster and help and elevate our women uh, to be leaders. And, and, you know, I wish that number would be even bigger, but it's already double than the rest, you know, non-Tourism, non-Indigenous tourism businesses. So we have to be proud of that. Um, we know as well that uh, for us in Canada, 57% of the workers that we currently have within our industry are actually Indigenous people. So, you know, take, take the number anywhere else that you want, but like we're four times higher than anywhere else. Uh, we know this has huge advantage. So if we are taking about 60,000 jobs, then that means, you know, over 35,000 of them would be Indigenous people. So we uh, provide good quality careers to indigenous people. Uh, we provide as well a way of keeping our culture alive. We provide ways to make sure that we maintain, uh, you know, projects on the land and making sure that we have always an access and making sure as well that we keep traditions and, and languages alive. So this is very important that we continue to do that work. As far as what we do for the government, we, uh, you know, when we look at different numbers, uh, ITAC uh, through the, um, Conference Board of Canada did a research 
and uh, in taxation in Canada, the return on investment uh, to the federal, provincial, and municipal government is over seven hundred million dollars in taxation. So we're not a small contributor. A lot of people think that you know Indigenous people don't pay taxes and don't pay income taxes, which is completely false. A lot, of, yes, there they are a few, uh, but not all our businesses are actually operating on reserve. So there's you know the Indian Act does uh, affect some of the ability, uh, but also comes with lots of negative impact that we have through and negotiate through the different recovery programs of uh, the the government of Canada. But we bring back seven hundred million dollars. Uh, we um, we've set this this standard so creating. Uh, becoming the world leader in Indigenous tourism by 2030 would also mean that there's a $2.6 billion investment that needs to be done for infrastructures because we need to create 800 new businesses. If we are to do that, um, you know, the government of Canada would receive contributions of over $1.129 uh, $1 billion in tax dollars by 2030. This is huge. This is huge because we're asking them for, you know, money to help us, but it would take them five years to recuperate that money. So it is it is viable. We are showing the government that, you know, investing in Indigenous tourism is investing in our future, in our well-being of our uh, nations and, and, and band members. Uh, you know, we're, we're talking a lot about sustainable development, but like we're proud to support the United Nations World Tourism Organizations to the mandate, you know, to promote responsible, sustainable uh, tourism, you know, for the 2030 uh, vision. Uh, you know, ITAC has set standards, so we have some of the, you know, goals here, but ITAC is, uh, you know, contributing to um, 12 of, of those, uh, you know, SDGs that are very important for our communities. So we got to continue in working and making sure that we promote a better tourism, a more sustainable tourism. Uh, and, you know, it goes back to our values. Indigenous values are always around, like, protecting the land, protecting hearth, and and protecting some of the sacred areas that we have. So there's huge opportunity, the social impacts are huge, and uh, that's why we, we continue to work in, in this field and we continue to be present at some of those uh, events and organizations and, and, and you know seminars because we feel like it's extremely important that indigenous people take this space now and uh, as stewards of the land. In Canada, we, we talk a lot about reconciliation with indigenous people. Um, you know, uh, Canada has been uh, heavily impacted with, uh, well, first of all, the Indian Act, but after that, the creation by the church and the government of Canada to residential schools. And last one closed down in 1996. Uh, so it's very, very still fresh, um, but also meaning that a lot of our Indigenous people went through, uh, or their kids uh, went through residential schools, and there was a lot of sexual abuse, a lot of, um, you know, like uh, beating, fighting, uh, you know, the intention of those schools were to make the Indians, the indigenous people, um, a good Christian, and, and that we would forget uh, about being a savage, we would, um, you know, become great Canadian citizen. And by doing that, they, um, they were stealing the kids away from their families and putting them into schools at their young age. And to do that, they were like, doing a lot of testing on them, um, you know, taking like meals away and shaving them. They were not allowed to speak the language. They were not allowed to uh, talk to their brothers and sisters. They were not allowed to practice their culture either. Um, so it, it's been it, 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 it's been recognized here in Canada as a genocide. Um, the papal visit last year um, did also offer uh, the papal apologies to Indigenous people. Um, I, I encourage any one of you to go through and read about the reconciliation in Canada. I think it's very important for, for everyone's knowledge. Uh, obviously, now this is a tourism presentation, so I wanted to just keep it brief. But uh, we are just entering now uh, in Indigenous History Month and, and as well as, um, you know, September 30th for us, which is Truth and Reconciliation Day. Uh, it should be a week, it should be a month, it should be a year, it should be bigger, it should be every day, it should always be present in our mind and, and, and in everything that we do. But uh, we, we September 30th is a big day for us and making sure that we honor um, those who lost their lives. Um, you know, there's over 50,000 people that died through those uh, residential schools. And unfortunately, a lot of them were just buried in massive and mass grave and not identified. So parents still believe that or 
you know, they don't know what happened to their kids. So are they still alive somewhere? Have they been sold to the 60s coops? Are they um, anywhere like in, in a ditch anywhere else? Like we don't know. And uh, it's been the deep scars, uh, d- deep trauma for our communities. So we invite people to, you know, for us in tourism, we keep on saying that Indigenous tourism is reconciliation in action because investing in Indigenous tourism creates and expand economic development projects with Indigenous nations, which, you know, support self-determination. But we are also a, a, a convey to visitors who wants to learn about Indigenous residential schools because we have like different tours that can be done now and some of the survivors that actually talk about their experience. Um Traumatizing, obviously, but it is something that, you know, people are are wanting to better understand. And I'll show some of the research project that we've done about that. Um, you know, for us um, as well, like here in Canada, we, we are saying that uh, um, we uh, the more we um, sorry, uh, the more we continue to to build towards this recognition and land recognition and continuing to help and support Indigenous communities, the better we we can all gain because um, you know, for us, we keep on saying that diversity is having a seat at the table, right? And but inclusion is now like being included in actions with the government or at different levels or board uh, board levels is having a voice to be you know at that table. But really, what is the most important is belonging, and belonging for us is having our voice being heard and being listened to. As stewards of the land, um, you know, reconciliation starts with acknowledgement and understanding that we are not coming all from the same place. Uh, understanding as well that um, we're, we're, especially in tourism, we all have the same um, destination, uh, but we're not all in the same boat. And it's something that needs to be understood because some have greater means of transportation. You know, some people will use canoes. Some people use kayaks. Some people will use paddleboard to get to their destination. Um, and some don't have any flotation devices. Uh, so they have to swim there. So we're not all equal at this stage and we're not all the same. We don't have all the same means, but the important is to all have the same destinations. And if you can pick up a few passengers along the way, then you know this is great for all of us. As far as reconciliation, I'd like to show that quick video just about what it is here in Canada and how we work um, in Indigenous tourism reconciliation in action. It's time. It's time to hear our stories. To see our history come alive. As you might see, it is that just a landscape. It's time to feel our deep connections to the land, to take part in our traditions, and to know our diverse nations. It's time. It's time to see beauty. It's time to see us. It's time for the truth of the It's time So this is some of the work that we do in order for us to invite Canadians to learn about indigenous culture and as well to our international guests that are coming within our communities. To understand like what shaped us like and what shaped this country uh canada uh, we all come from the land we're all like from turtle island and uh, we call our canada canada uh, which is from our original language um, and used in many different languages as well um right now as well like what i said earlier is demand exceeds the capacity right and, and prior to covid uh, indigenous tourism was the fastest growing sector in in canada outpacing the rest of the uh, general um, tourism industry at 20.5% versus 14.5%. The demand, the demand for Indigenous tourism experiences have never been higher. 
In fact, like it, we've seen it from a lot of different markets. One in three international visitors to Canada are interested in Indigenous tourism experiences. Visitors from France, 63%, Germany, 47% of the most likely to be interested in Indigenous tourism experiences entering the country. 33% of the US, 35% of China. We have huge potential to continue to expand the work that we do and, and have more of our international guests coming into the country. In fact, um, right now as well, Destination Canada did a survey on the US side. And you know, from the top 1% and, mo- and top 10% most affluent traveler in the US, one of the first thing they wanna see is indigenous culture. So we have to take advantage of that because those are people with the money that can travel within our communities and, and go on the remote portions. And, you know, we have to capitalize on the interests of this, uh, any markets. Japan as well, 21% of the market is interested in traveling. You know, there's, so, there's potential coming from any single market that we work in. As far as consumer sentiment now, because this, this has changed drastically since, you know, we, we entered um, what we call reconciliation, although reconciliation is not new. Um, but since, you know, Kamloops saw some of the um, uh, first initial findings of, of uh, the remains of bodies. Uh, so 86% have a positive opinion of Indigenous people in their province and the rest of Canada. 88% of Canadians are interested in participating in at least one Indigenous cultural tourism activity. We didn't have that before. It was not like that. This has changed drastically. So I'm pretty happy and I'm pretty stoked to see those results because for us, it also means that people now understand what we went through and want to learn and they want to be a part, you know? So it's it's already, it's it's really, really positive signals that we're getting. 75% are most interested in learning about the history of Indigenous people. And I'm hoping this is what we see across the country as well. And I'm hoping in Brazil, this is what we see. And I know this is what we're starting to see in Colombia and Chile and other, other countries that we're working in. 74% of them are most interested in learning about tradition and heritage. So it's good. This is what we've been doing. This is what we've been doing all along for the past, you know, 100 years. Um, though one of the main problems that we have is that 30% lack the awareness of where to find Indigenous tourism. And they don't know what it is. They don't know, uh, you know, how far they have to travel. Uh, they don't know, like, how much time they need. And they think it's often classroom-like. And that's why we did... Uh, when COVID started to hit, uh, you know, we were kind of like stuck behind our, you know, our screens and working from home and not traveling anymore. And that's why we went through a lot of our identity research. So we've used Insignia uh, to learn about, you know, like just like the, um, just understanding the perceptions of, you know, how people perceive Indigenous tourism. And this was very enlightening for us because everything that we do in the marketing department is tied to the research that we normally uh, have concluded or done. So one of the very important piece was this one here, uh, the insignia, a COVID-19 driven interest assessment on Canada domestic market. One thing that, you know, it was really for us to understand their mindset, their behavior, and what else we could do better uh, to continue to enhance like indigenous tourism. Um, so in that research, one of the three key items that came out of that was the interest of having an indigenous experience is extremely high. A lot of people wanted to learn more, but the awareness of the experiences were really low. And people did not know what was an authentic indigenous uh, experience, what it was. So, and some of the continuous challenges that we had to continue to assess, like that people don't know where to find indigenous experiences and, you know, the collaborations and support from the tourism industry needs uh, a lot of improvement. And that's why we came up with, you know, like, understanding and trying to think about what is indigenous tourism how do we build indigenous tourism how do we uh, build a brand that is going to talk about authenticity and that's going to promote authentic indigenous experiences to the world and how they can find easily indigenous tourism and this is where we started to look at what is indigenous tourism we started to look at for example native as a word uh you know and started to look at ancient First Nations uh, and uh, Aboriginals. And, and we looked at all those synonyms and we landed on what we call the original original. And why the original original is because we are the original people of the land. That was one of the key words that kept on coming back is from any single nations or anything that is ancient, newer, um, 
like it was their prior original was always the the, the main uh, topic, the main word that would come back. And when we started to jam those ideas together with our creative uh, Maku Maku, we, uh, we looked at, hey, no one else can actually have more original experiences than the original people of the land. And that's how it sparked the main idea of creating the original original. And I, I'm truly, really proud of this work that we've done because when building this brand, we knew that this could be tied and this could be used by any other indigenous tourism association in the world because we can all claim to be the original people of the land and no one else can take that away from us because no one else can deliver more original businesses and more original experiences than the original people of the land. No one else. That's us. Like indigenous people uh, have one brand. So we've decided to create this as, yes, a logo that would sustain in time. And if you look at the logo, it's a, it's a double O. Uh, there's multiple O's in there. And why is that? It's for continuations. And it also is like because a circle has no bend. And we're all within the circle from our indigenous partners to our non-indigenous friends and allies. Everyone can evolve within the, like the circle. Uh, we're always, you know, like a, a, like when you look at a chain as an example, you know, there's always one of the weak, uh, weak portion of the chain that could break. But in a circle, we don't have that. So everyone is within the circle. And for us, it was the intention of keeping our the burning desire to continue to advance as Indigenous people and thriving as an Indigenous tourism industry. And that's why you see the flame in there. The flame is also shaped as feathers, representing the eagle. Eagles is actually the creator. Uh, it sends the messages to the creator. And for us, it was very important to have that deep meaning, but not get into the cliches of, of all the three nations. And that's why we created three flames. Like the, the flames has three uh, because, yes, it is Métis First Nation and Inuit people. And we all survive because of the importance of fire. And, you know, for us, that's really uh, how it's part of the idea, the intention. And we have developed this into a mark of excellence, which I'll talk very shortly. So I'm just going to run this quick video to show you the diversity of our nations. So now you saw the three nations that we represent uh, here in Canada. It's very important that we always keep that in mind. We Indigenous people are not only First Nations. We also include our Métis, as well as our Northern partners, uh, our brothers and sisters, our, the Inuit uh, communities and Inuit people. Um, having said that, uh, you know, ITAC has been over the years developing authentic Indigenous experiences in Canada, we created national guidelines. And those national guidelines uh, creates a have checklists for assessing and developing the businesses against the industry standards, but also is a step to ensure that authenticity is being delivered. And, and through this work, uh, we're extremely proud because this is a trademark piece of Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, and we've been implementing and helping and supporting some of our countries, especially in Latin America, to develop their own national guidelines with, you know, the help of ITAC through the work that we've been doing, uh, you know, uh, as far as the national uh, guidelines created, um, because it is an easy step-by-step -step process. And I'm just going to get into this process right now. But those are the countries that right now we've been working with in developing some of the international services. We have, a, uh, you know, we've done a lot of, a lot of work with the, some of the countries named here. Uh, methodologies in you know indigenous tourism market preparations which is one of the higher uh, most important one the mark of excellence the original original and we do a lot of uh, consumer research impact studies and more to help shape uh, and, and help can you hear me it says the sound has been cut 
seeing none. You can yeah. keep going. Uh, I'm okay. sorry. Okay. It's okay. Um, so yeah, this is how we develop the uh, obviously the original original. And what the original original is is an accreditation program. It's the mark of excellence. It is uh, you know uh, an accreditation program that has set national standards for indigenous tourism businesses and allow businesses to evaluate their market readiness and apply for a, a different accreditation. This reflects the ISO standards, and it is the only accreditation program that is indigenous led. Uh, created for Indigenous people in tourism industry, as well as representing the ISO standards. And it is to provide, you know, like th this to, like behind all of this, what we needed to fix was the fact that people don't know what is an authentic Indigenous experiences. And they don't know how to define that. And they don't know actually what is authentic because in markets, in prep, like in promotions, a lot of people sell Indigenous experiences, but a lot of them are in, fake indigenous uh, communities. They could be fake indigenous art. There could be, you know, fake indigenous experiences. And having an accreditation program really helps us to shape and help consumer understand that anyone that goes through this program, you know, has a quality uh, indigenous tourism product, you know, that is promoting and, and, and is sustainable, that has a good visitor experience, you know, that, that follows the higher health and safety and comfort guidelines you know that has the best business acumen and practices uh and also that is authentic authentic meaning that is 51 percent owned and operated and that benefits of those businesses goes to the communities and that's very important because what we've seen throughout the years is a lot of people are wanting to take advantage of a trend which is indigenous tourism a lot of people are wanting to say oh i've got a i've got a teepee in my background that means i'm indigenous no it's not how it works it really isn't. And that's why it's very important for us that we continue to identify our businesses with one brand, one mark, that anywhere they go in the world, that they can identify the original original and that they understand that by having an original original of businesses is that they contribute to, uh, you know, uh, economy in indigenous communities. And this is actually an accredited businesses. So it is very, very important work. And also for us, what we, we wanted to do is to also help our businesses from business ready uh, to take them into visitor ready and to, in the end, get them into the export readiness. And that's kind of the fast track program is we use our leaders to elevate our other businesses. So they understand in DC that here's the steps that you need to take in order to be at that level. And if you are at that level, you're going to get the stamp. And if you get the stamp, you know, you're entitled to use the original, original mark of excellence. And that continues to drive the consumer, the confidence that they have, that they're choosing a quality experience. And you know that the benefits of all of this actually goes back to our businesses and our communities. So this is one of the most important program that we've built over the years. It's, it took us two years. We've been implementing this over the last year. We now have over 350 businesses within that collection. We are in discussions with different countries in order to start implementing the original original brand and the mark of excellence because it is the only one in the world right now that does exist and certifying uh, authentic indigenous businesses. A lot of them has been protecting indigenous culture, but none, none of the program has been a mark of excellence with ISO standards. Um, for us, we keep on saying we're the original storytellers and, and, and storytelling is vital to our indigenous cult culture, right? Uh, we all come from very, very long line of storytellers. I'm probably the one that always talk way too much. And that's why normally in an hour, I always, you know, have a 10, 15 minutes extra. I'm sorry, Edmar, I'm just telling you right away that, you know, my presentation may run long. Uh, just kidding. I'm, I'm going to try to fit no it in. But, <laughs> uh, but for us, like uh, one of the most important is what people are wanting. And that comes from the different research, but it's authenticity and human connection. When we're traveling now, We've been talking about experiential travel. We've been talking about transformational travel. This is what we do. This is what we've been doing all along. Our indigenous communities and our indigenous people and experiences have been sharing their way of life for over 100 years. Like in Quebec, if we take the city here, that's more than 400 years of sharing with Quebec City and the foundation of this city. So we've been doing this for ages and ages. And it is very important that we continue to share this because now when we travel, we travel differently. And that's why we've seen a huge intake, uh, uptake in indigenous tourism. 
we're, we're the natural flow of visitation was just naturally, you know, towards like our authentic way of life. And, you know, we don't need to be fake. We don't need to have a Disneyland of indigenous people wearing regalias and costumes. No, that's not what it is. Indigenous tourism is so diverse. Indigenous tourism is more in powwow. It is with the poet that, you know, surrounds us, the writers, the photographers, it's the musicians, it's everyone that is embedded within, you know, the tourism industry, because we're trying to create a multi-sensorial experience. It's through the food, it's through smelling, you know, you're smelling the fire, the smoke. So it's all this that makes our experiences so unique. And over everything that is the most important is obviously, we keep on saying, Indigenous content needs to be led by Indigenous people. No one else can actually steal that space away from us. We're not like, and, and again, when there's a trend, there's always people wanting to take over uh, what we do. And, and, you know, like, but no, the Indigenous content is for us, led by us. Like if you're, we, we keep on saying, it is not about us without us. So if you are to talk about Indigenous people, just make sure that, you know, we have, you, you, you've talked to us because you shouldn't be, we want you to help. And, and promote and support and be a partner. But you can't talk on our behalf. You can't make decision on our behalf. And that's the most important. Uh, like the continuation of this presentation as well, like what they're looking for is the unique experiences and hearing our personal perspective. And for me, this is the most important because that's why stewards of the land and that's uh, as stewards and as protector of the land, we need to protect our sacred spaces we need to keep some areas for our people uh, to make sure that they heal, uh, that they have the spaces to go and gather and find medicinal plants that they need to go harvest, you know, for, for food. Uh, so it is very important, but we can all share this within the tourism experience. And that's why it makes it so special. I want to touch on one thing and one thing about cultural appropriation versus cultural appreciation. And for me, it is very important because when we talk about cultural appropriation, it is meant to be something that is taken away from oppressed culture. And, you know, obviously in our days, like we still see like way too much of this. Cultural appropriation is a theft base, you know, on power and privilege, while appreciation is a commitment on, you know, based on responsibilities and based on ethics. So it's completely different. I want people to really understand that, you know, like wearing an indigenous shirt doesn't make you cultural appropriation. Like, I want you to understand that because we don't want to hurt our businesses. Our businesses are trying to create economic reconciliation. If they create shirts, it's for you to buy, and it's for you to appreciate the shirts. What we're asking you though, is not create indigenous shirts with our consent. And that's a big difference. Again, in appropriation, there's only the person that appropriates, you know, who benefits to our detriment. In appreciation, it's completely different, right? There's an, an exchange, a recognition, you know, it's a permission. Very, 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 very two separate things. So I want to be careful because when we talk about indigenous land, indigenous content, no one else should talk about, like a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are scared of making mistakes, but we don't want, we want you guys to talk about us. We want you guys to be a part, but refer to us when it comes to share content. Like use our content, don't create content. We already have this content created. Let us help you share our stories. Let us be a part of the stories. And that's, that's a key message that I want you guys to remember uh, when we talk about uh, reconciliation and when we talk about cultural appropriation, because we still need your help. We're not in, like, we're all in this together, but there's a definition of roles and responsibilities that needs to take place. So for us, the infamous funnel, uh, you know, creating awareness, taking in considerations and converting. This is what ITAC has taken as a mandate to create educational pieces that, you know, helps people understand Indigenous culture, make them consider a trip into Indigenous communities, and in the end, make sure that we help them convert and find a place where they can actually buy a package. Because remember what you saw in the research project is people did not know where to find indigenous tourism experiences. So we've tackled this. We've tackled this along the many other things that we've been doing. And that's through the different marketing activations that we do. 
Um, you know, for us right now in all major cities that you go across, you're going to see our indigenous original, original buses, you know, to experience the original way of doing things. When you are in Halifax, Montreal, Quebec, Toronto, Vancouver, Calgary, Edmonton, Regina, Saskatoon, you're going to come across those buses. You're going to come across, you know, train wrap and transit wrap. And when you go to the airport, yeah, you're going to see us again. And, you know, like this, all those, those advertisings on carousels, they're by the luggage claim. They're, you know, within the airport, inviting visitors to come and find a way to understand what Indigenous culture is, what our Indigenous tourism experiences are, and where to find them. We have to tackle this because no one else is giving, you, giving us this opportunity in that space. So, in, you know, we've got airport glass wraps, you know, in different countries and different airports uh, and boarding, uh, border crossing in ports, uh, you know, when we have a lot of cruises. Uh, we've done a lot of, you know, glass wraps. This is one of my community with Anwa Lumina. This is a light show that we have, uh, one, uh, you know, one, one of the greater projects that we've been building in the last, um, you know, year and a half. Uh, and, and yeah, this, we, need to, we need to be in that space. People want to know Indigenous culture, but they don't know how to find it. So we got to continue to build that awareness and have them see us in order for them to find us, right? And the intention behind this is that we create a poster series. And those poster series are meant to be just fun, interactive, kind of like easy reading. Uh, but when you go through them, you know, this is where you actually, what is the original original? And, and, uh, and what's aromatherapy? And then they read the text at the bottom and then they can find a way where they can find us. And that is after that transferred into, we have their data, we can connect with them and then we can send them according to the experiences and their needs and what they're trying to do and where they're trying to go and which language they're talking. We're trying to, after that, push them different opportunities that they can find Indigenous tourism. And that's how we've been doing our marketing here in Canada. So we have a, a series of posters. Again, we represent, um, you know, 13 provinces and territories. So there's Northern, Southern, uh, East and West uh, tourism experiences, Métis, Inuit, and uh, First Nation experiences. It is just meant to be fun and interactive. Um, in Canada as well, we leverage a lot of our nation's magazine, a lifestyle magazine that talks about Indigenous tourism, but from a very light perspective and invites people to come and discover our culture. But we want to talk about modern opportunities. Like, let's talk about like the meaningful ways of, you know, tattooing. And, and do people understand like the, the origin of tattooing and why? So in this, for example, magazine, we talk about, you know, tattoos and, and the meaning of tattoos and how, you know, like through, through ink, ink masters, they are also sharing their own stories. And sharing our stories should not only be like by the voice. It is, it is done by poets. It is done by musicians. It is done by artists and artisans through their craft. And we all have those stories. And it's just a matter of taking the time to appreciate the stories. Uh, we continue to, on social media, enhance some of the you know, beautiful experiences that we have across the country and share those stories. Uh, we just want them to understand what we go through. And for us, one thing that worked extremely well is the, the educational turnkey content. And we share some of the pre-made content, turnkey content to Destination Canada, Brand USA, or anyone else who wants to be a part of our journey. And so they're not creating Indigenous content on our behalf. We're creating the content. They are leveraging and that means that we're all working together and that gives us all an opportunity to be partners and allies and working together and advancing all together. And so this is an example, you know, red dress day uh, that we've been creating right now as well. We just launched today. It's not in my presentation, but we've launched today as well, September 30th, uh, Truth and Reconciliation, or Insured Day, uh, which is another piece uh, of very important uh, and, and learning about the difficult um, traumas that have been occurring here in, in Canada. Um, you know, we have to support our people and, and we have to be allies and, and creating spaces for those stories to be told because if there's healing to happen, um, the more we talk about this, the more there's an understanding 
uh, the more all together we can advance and, and the more those those families and survivors can actually heal and they, some may not never heal from from this and um, but we have to be understanding and we have to make sure that you know we understand where they're coming from uh, for us as well we create destination indigenous uh, with an interactive map you see the map this is where you have indigenous experiences where they say they can't find us now they have a way they have a way when they come to canada they know where we are we have a package directory that people can go and book directly some of the amazing experiences that we have in canada so this is the work that we do at itac uh, Indigenous Tourism Association of Canada, sorry, ITAC. And, and we got to continue working uh, to advance on some of the issues. We have a labor campaign because we know that right now we, we, we struggle everywhere in the world, I, I believe, is, is struggling finding, you know, good qualified person to come and work within the tourism industry. And we feel at ITAC that we're giving career opportunities. And it's important that we highlight those. And that's why we created a labor strategy. Uh, we have labor communications and a marketing campaign that is tied. But we also have a website. You know, people can just leave their resumes if they want to work in our tourism industry. They can find jobs that are within our tourism industry. And we're inviting them and inviting our youth to come and consider Indigenous tourism as a pathway to a, a career. And, and, you know, it's it's not only janitor work. It's, you could be a general manager. You could be an experiences owner. You could be a guide, you could be anyone, anyone you want to be. And that's what we're trying to really foster. I just want to share uh, one last video here, and then I'm going to conclude on some of the portions about partnering for growth and how to be a good ally. We have a story to tell. It's an opportunity for us to share our culture about who we really are. Across Canada, there's a vibrant Indigenous history. It's the heritage of our country. Communities who are sharing their culture as storytellers of a continuous tradition. Inviting you to live experiences that reconnect you to the land, to your spirit. Step into the dance. Join the beat of the drum, and feel the earth's heartbeat, a sound that will last forever. So those are uh, obviously some of the videos um, available, normally French English and um, always French English, uh, but also uh, in Spanish and right now, as well, which, you know, anyone that does speak Spanish, we could, you know, send you the link of those videos. There's often as well translation, been working a lot with the Japanese market recently. So those are subtitles as well. Um, but it, it, it brings me back to the last portion of my presentation and it's how to partner for growth. Uh, I know we're not all indigenous uh, at, on this, uh, this seminar today and this presentation. So how to be a good ally? And for us in Canada, this is what we encourage people to do. And, you know, to be a good ally, it means that, you know, we hope that you read the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final reports. We want you to understand, you know, some of the recommendations that have been done and understand where we're coming from, you know, and, and, and act on some of those, uh, you know, recommendations that have been done uh, to help and, and foster reconciliation within our communities and, and make us all like a more equal society. Um, we want you to believe in the experiences that, you know, like the residential school survivors have gone through. You need to trust like what they say to you. We're not inventing stories. This all happens. And, you know, as devastating as, as some of the stories are, and, and it's, it's crazy to even think that, you know, we could, we could go down this journey and down this path. Like it's, 
it's unbelievable some of the, the you know some of the punishment that were given to indigenous people and a lot of people pass away and it's it's crazy to think that in canada um but i know it happened differently elsewhere and when we talk about like for example like black lives matter and i'm never going to take anything away from black lives matter but for example when we had the this huge uh, police officer um Chauvin that took over uh floyd and uh, you know, in Canada during that same week, three indigenous people died from gunshots from police officers during that same week. No one else talked to about it. No one, no one. So is an indigenous life not as important? I have to question myself, but we got to continue advancing and we have to continue to put trust and, and hope for the future and, and bring our children, you know, making sure that they understand where they're coming from, but look back to fuel in the future. Um, you know, we want you to demand justice for Indigenous peoples, land, and communities. We need you as an ally. Remember, Indigenous inherent rights and land treaty rights are a non-negotiable piece. This is in store. This is there. Don't try to justify and go around this. Like, just work with it. Like, it's there. Like, it's it's been something that it's been signed with the government. Sometimes, you know, like, despite sometimes, like, our, our own consent. But they're there, and then we have to use them to our own advantage. And, and, you know, like it's, it's very important that we understand when there's a land, it starts with the recognition and not only that, but the involvement of the nations within development projects. Um, we want you to celebrate indigenous culture and to amplify, uplift and support indigenous people. It's very important. As I said, we may not be all in the same boat because of the different means of transportation that we have, but we all have the same destination. And this is the most important for us. Um, you know, we need you to break the systemic barriers that exist and help your children understand equality. You know, we're all the same. We're all humans. Um, you know, that you're indigenous, that you're Chinese, black, or anyone else, you know, that exists. We have to respect who you are and we're all equal. Let's, let's remember that. But we need to teach our children to be better understanding of equality what is racism and what is equality. Um, we need to support indigenous lab programs and foundations, you know, that help survivors and their families this is very important and be a part, like be a part of our journey together, you know, on the same path, the same journey. We're all together into this and learning along the way. And reconciliation happens very fast here in Canada. Sometimes we don't even know like for ourselves, like what would be the proper steps because Everyone is coming with ideas. But in the end, like we just got to remember that we're doing this to help survivors and their families and making sure that, you know, things like that will never happen again in our country and anywhere else, because it's just crazy to think that. Um, for us at ITAC, in closing, you know, we've, we've created a certificate in reconciliation for the tourism industry. Uh, you know, it's a truth and recon reconciliation awareness program that we provide our non-Indigenous tourism industry partners. Uh, it's a two-day program, and we want people to be a part of those programs to learn about, like, you know, just Indigenous in, in indigenous rights, uh, Indigenous reconciliation and economic reconciliation and how we can be better allies all together in creating that awareness. Um, ITAC as well uh, created, and we announced this very recently, a tourism reconciliation uh, partnership through the Indigenous Tourism Destination Fund. Uh, revenue source to, you know, partner with government funding, but it's it's uh, amended, like it's a, it's a volunteer program that we ask corporations to uh, include uh, as 25 cents per customers. And this goes to a fund to help uh, create the, the 2030 vision and help bringing those infrastructures and help market indigenous experiences. So we've had a huge, huge uh, uptake. We've launched very recently. Very proud to have Expedia as a partner, which just signed up today as well. Uh, we have Airbnb, WestJet, you know, up on, up off tours uh, in Vancouver. We have Rocky Mountaineer. We're working with many other partners uh, that are wanting to support the vision and help and support and be behind indigenous tourism because they know that you know, we may not be the main wagon, like, or the main train carrying all the tourism businesses, but we're a pretty damn looking wagon. And we know what we can bring to the table. And we know indigenous tourism is a sought after experience. So how do we make sure that we all sign together is by having inclusion.
We've had as well our Indigenous Tourism Conference last year in you know Winnipeg. Uh, it was uh, 1,100 uh, th- 1,100 delegates uh, from around the globe. This is the largest Indigenous Tourism Conference in the world. Uh, we invite people to come in. This is your invitation to our 26th to 28th February in 2024 International Indigenous Conference. We hope you mark your calendars. Early birds are tickets are on sale right now. We um, we want you to be a part and learn how to be a good partners. And just this event for us has been one of the key highlights in, in the work that we do because you see the pride of Indigenous people. You see that, you know, the idea sparking and the emotions that comes through and really is something amazing. It is amazing, all the ideas and the projects that comes to the table and the many discussions and healthy discussions uh, to all be better leaders and all be better uh, contributors. So I'm hoping you enjoy this presentation. I'm hoping you're going to join us uh, to the International Indigenous Tourism Conference. I'm hoping I didn't speak too fast for the translators, or and I'm sorry it had to be in English. Um, here's how you can join us. We will be sharing this presentation with you guys as well, so it's not an issue. And I'd like to just close by saying I, I, I appreciate everyone and all the work that you guys are doing to help Indigenous people and, and our Indigenous communities across the world and across the globe. Uh, and helping us take the space and in, 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 in have our stories being listened to. For too long, we were told not to share our stories, but this can no longer be. And we, you can benefit uh, from, you know, like indigenous knowledge, indigenous culture, uh, from our elders. We're all in this together and we all want to advance to make a, a, the world a better place to live and an equal place uh, for all of us to to their well-being and i think that's the closing comments that i'd like to have um don't feel bad or if you haven't been as heavily involved you know like find ways to be involved within some of the work that we do or that some other corporations or countries are doing with their indigenous leaders be a part talk to you know talk to us talk about us uh be a part of the journey and together we can make this this world a better place and a more sustainable place for all of us so thank you so much for your attention. Wow, Sebastian. Wow. No words. It was a wonderful presentation. And thank you very much for bring all this information to, to this event. It is really appreciated for us because the results we want to promote with all this conversation we are having today and tomorrow. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, in in our presentation as well another indigenous uh, indigenous people from uh, White Bear First Nation. Uh, his name is Joel Marriott. He will speak today and tomorrow. Today, uh, his presentation is at five p.m. and tomorrow at four p.m. Uh, he is doing an amazing job as well. Uh, work with tourists and. Uh, with handcraft solutions for housing and tourism accommodations. And I, I, I really appreciate the, the contribution of indigenous people to the tourism industry, but not just to that, uh, the contribution for our planet. It's very important for us to understand your culture, to understand your language, to understand your knowledge, to bring all this uh, to the sustainable development actions to the climate uh, change actions to the regeneration of our planet and i, I really appreciate it. thank you sebastian well i mark thank you for all well, thank you for inviting us and having indigenous voices onto uh, you know this conference because you're right we can all learn from our elders and make sure that we protect our you know mother earth and it's uh, by like making sure that there's not over tourism, making sure that we have people going to remote communities as well and understanding our indigenous way of life and the way we protect the land and the ways while well our people can actually use tourism to make sure that we protect sacred areas, you know, where sepulchers, where we have some of our elders and some, you know, like some, so, so, so our ancestors are buried or like the way they want us to protect the animals as well. So I think it's very important that we have those discussions and I really thank you for having this opportunity to present. And I'm glad I'm not the only Indigenous person uh, 
Joel, like uh, I'm really happy to see you there and, and I'm hoping that, you know, like you'll have a fruitful um, discussions as well with the rest of the group. Thank you. Sebastian, uh, I have a question for you. How we can bring the original original to Brazil? What are the first steps to to bring this knowledge to our indigenous communities here? Well, I would say, uh, I mean, I, I love the question uh, because it is something that we will be announcing at our Indigenous Tourism Conference in February 26 to 28. So I would say, Enmar, one of the first step would be to register to attend the conference <laughs> and to find out uh, how we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to start talking next week as well at the Indigenous Tourism Conference with IENTA, the uh, U.S. Uh, counterpart of ITAC, so the Indigenous uh, American Indian uh, Native Tourism um, association uh we're going to be starting to talk about how we're going to start implementing some of the work jointly uh it, it does come with you know like for us it's a, it's a mark of excellence it's an iso standard so we have to make sure that some of the um uh, uh i would say industry slack criteria are respected because we don't want to water down like the the the, the quality of the experiences so we'll have to work very diligently Uh, but what we have in mind is a bit of a franchise system, a bit of a star alliance system, which, you know, like original, original is the star alliance brand. And then underneath it carries like Air Canada, Air New Zealand and all the rest of those operators. So those will become our countries. Um, we want to make sure that we adapt and tailor this approach to Latin America uh, because we know some of the main industry standards are not going to be the same. So um, it's going to take a bit of time, uh, but we're all original original and you know like we we gotta we're going to be working towards those goals together um once we start um, embarking into that journey with some other of our uh, countries in, in international markets uh we'll let you know but i think mr uh you can start talking about this you know start talking to leaders and and making sure as well that indigenous communities and leadership are understanding of what is the mark and that there's an opportunity for us to start using all this amazing, thoughtful, indigenous-led marks for our benefits and for the benefits of our consumer. And again, I, this is the most important portion of it, is that the, the insurance that it provides consumer. And, you know, like if we want to make sure that we have our space and that people visit indigenous tourism businesses that are authentic, um, then this is the mark that people will need. And this is the highest standards. So let's all make sure that we can elevate each other. Perfect, perfect. Uh, I will share this event, the event for next year, with some tra travel agents here in Brazil. And let's try to, to bring some uh, information translate to Portuguese and sell this event here for, for the Brazilians to go to Canada and visit the event, have the experience the event will provide to them. But more than that, they can have experience in Canada as well and enjoy the, the end of the winter time. You know, it's in February. It's a, a beautiful time to explore Canada. I, I have been in some indigenous communities uh, during this last winter, Gawanagi, Ganesatagi, Apesazni in Quebec, then the Data First Nation in Yellowknife, North, Northwest territories. That was one of the most authentic experiences I had in my life. I could to see the aurora. This, This picture in my back, it's from there. And they 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 had ice fishing, and we could to to cook that in the tent, and it was an amazing time. It's cold, right? It's mine. That was minus forty uh, five, feeling minus fifty degrees outside. But it, it's what Canada has to offer as authentic to to Brazilians and other countries that has no winter uh, to to live this experience uh yeah, I, yeah I, it, it is going to be cold you're right because it is <laughs> in canada uh does like as uh, you know ottawa is, is fairly south so i mean it, it should be fairly okay it's not going to be like yellow knife and where you really are like at the minus 45 but um it is an invitation and uh if we have a delegations uh an important delegations we could have live translations as well that could be offered Uh, I know we're going to have it in Spanish this year because like, there's a lot of uh, countries that we've been doing a lot of international works, for example, in Colombia, Panama and Mexico and um, as well, Chile, uh, that, you know, are and, and 
in Peru uh, that are wanting to come as well to our conference in Canada. We have best practice mission as well coming from Colombia in, in, in two months to learn about Indigenous experiences here in Canada and that can, they, they can structure and bring back some of those information to their own community leadership. So if we are to see a larger delegation, Admar, let me know, because if you can help us share that content there in, in Brazil, and then we can have more of the people coming into our conference, uh, we could easily offer that live translations, which makes it, you know, for, for everyone to learn and, and get inspired. Like, I think that's all we need is uh, everything has been so dark with COVID. We just need, uh, you know, we just need a bit of a light and we need to be motivated. And, and like, I think, you know, hearing all those beautiful stories helps us, uh, you know, keep hope for the future. Yeah, warm our hearts. Correct. Yeah. Step by yeah. step process. Thank you, thank you, and uh, we we will work on that together. Uh, Appreciate that. Anyone has questions? It's time to to make questions to Sebastian. If you want to to make this quest, Jonas, you hand your this. Hi, Mr. Sebastian. Uh, a question in Portuguese or English? Better. English is better if you. English. If you want. Okay, so uh, Mr. Sebastian, nice to meet you. <laughs> My name is Jonas Tanzak. I'm from uh, Brazil. Uh, we have a little farm in Mojo das Cruzes that we have projects, and I saw many, many good information from your presentation. Very, very nice. Thank you very much. And one point that I saw that we have similar demand and opportunity for for these people. For example, you mentioned about China, uh, US, and Japan. And we we know that in Brazil there are many indigenous uh, community and our area in Alto Chipe. Uh, we know that there are many indigenous community. So, because, uh, sorry, I'm not the indigenous and uh, descendant, but I see, I can see that good opportunity uh, for your business challenge. And I hope you to see your project in our area in the future. Thank you. Well, thanks, thanks for sharing. And I think you're right. And and one thing that I encourage people to, especially our indigenous people, is sometimes they don't realize that what they do on a daily basis, their chores, what they call their chores, actually is, you know, like a tourism product. <laughs> and, um, you know, I was in, uh, I was in Colombia uh, not too long ago and visiting some of the communities and, and, and one of the person was uh, like milking a cow and, and just transferring the milk and creating cheese. And I'm like, well, you know, this is a tourism experience. People could pay for that because like what you do on the land is like when I come or when someone comes from a city, they have no clue that this is actually something. And it's the end product that actually is on their table and on their plate. And it's, there's a process. And for me, this is also part of our traditional way of life, traditional like knowledge. And it's something that people are interested in. Like they want to learn, they're willing to learn, they're committing into learning. So I think it's a, a tourism offers such that beautiful pathway um, for understanding our chores and understanding the way of life. And uh, those markets are really, really all keen into learning all of this. Exactly. It's common people come to Brazil to go to indigenous community, but most commonly go to Amazon, for example. But here in Sao Paulo, there are many, many indigenous community also. And well, I'm, I don't have point of view because I'm not indigenous, but uh, following what they developing here, it's very, very opportunity to, to develop, for example, to reach and respect uh, the community. And yes, because as you said, indigenous life matter, it's very, very important to pro protect their traditional future and food and the future community here around the year. Yes. Yeah, absolutely agree. And uh, I mean, obviously, if there's anyone that you know at, uh, you know, the Brazilian government or any mm -hmm. national indigenous tourism organizations in Brazil that would like to take on tourism a bit more seriously, 
Um, we do have international services that we can provide help and support. We've done establishments of national guidelines in Chile. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been working very efficiently. We've done that in Colombia. We've organized, like, like I said, best practice missions. So people understand and they want to take mm -hmm. this uh, into their own hands. And uh, so let's hope that, you know, we can combine knowledge all together. And then, you know, because if it like that's that's one thing that we keep on saying, especially with the brand, is that if if, you know, Brazil succeed having an implementation of the original original, we all succeed because in the end, like we're all going to put marketing dollars towards the, you know, promotion of this brand. And therefore, like instead of having two million dollars invested, like we we end up with ten million dollars in investments, and then we people actually the consumer has this better understanding of what is a quality, authentic indigenous experience. So we all win, and if we win, our non-indigenous partner also win because that also means that there's more travelers coming in. So we're all in this together. So and that's that's the the key message in the end. Yeah, thank you very much. I will keep you following your job, your business. Hope this makes us in Brazil, awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Sebastian, it's important for us to tell you that Jonas uh, has a property in Mogi das Cruz and the strong farm in rural shores and nations is start to develop uh, its activities at Alchete region. And Mogi das Cruz is the main city uh, of 11 cities that has in the region. And he's starting to work with his uh, family property. It's a, a heritage Japanese property in in Mojitas Cruz, and we had visited uh, indigenous communities uh, next to, to his farm, uh, a Tupinaba community. Uh, one thing we have uh, most difficult to start a development with indigenous communities here, it's because of the funding. Uh, the government just start to, to bring more uh, attention to this matter, but it's not attended to everyone. We need to, to create this awareness to, to motivate the government to participate uh, in these initial stages of development to start to bring this funding and to start to, to make this tax return to, to, the, to, the, to the bank. So, and we, we are in the, in the last stage of this first stage of development and we are writing right now uh, a technical report to guide next steps of development of this region. And it will be our pleasure to bring uh, the knowledge of your work to this technical report and guide the funds to, to bring your work to Brazil as well. Well, thanks, Anmar. And I think, yeah, one of the first steps, obviously having a national body, which would help uh, building the research projects and the tools necessary to convince the government, right? So. By having an economic assessment done in the country uh, to know like how many indigenous tourism businesses are in Brazil, what's the weight, what's you know what's the employment, uh, how many people, what's their contribution. Having all this information helps convince the government, you know, that they can invest, and after that, show the return on investment by you know the social return on impact, like and, and the impact on communities, health, and social, uh, as well as you know having better infrastructures just for indigenous people to be able to, you know, gather and, and maintain a social life. So I think it's, it's huge. Like the social impact and the economic impact are, are two, two big things that tourism can bring into our communities, as well as, you know, maintaining our languages alive and our culture. And so I think it's, it's extremely important, but you need that one first initial organization that actually can put all the tools together. And we have an easy pathway for that. So, I mean, happy to discuss, uh, with anyone who wants to take this on as a challenge. Fantastic.